I was about to say, where's my barking? Um, <laughs> today is a really special episode because today we have a mom that we love so much. She's been part of our community for the past few years. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, thank you welcome, so much for welcome. having me. Yay! We can't <laughs> wait to chat. Today we are going to be talking about a controversial topic. I think if you live in the United States and Europe, maybe it's not so controversial in other countries where this is not so prevalent, but we're going to be talking about not drinking alcohol um, and the impact that has in the mom culture um, and all the nonsense that comes with it because I think that we can all agree that once you become a mom, especially in the US, it's sort of like, oh, you become a mom, you drink wine, you know, you cope with it with wine. And again, wow. just I put a reminder out there, we are zero judgment zone. As we speak right now, Stephanie drinks no alcohol. I don't drink alcohol, but I cannot wait to have a glass of wine in the south of France when I get to Europe this summer. Um, and Paola drinks wine regularly. So we have absolutely no judgment either way. We just want to discuss and sort of like explore a little bit more on the topic and what it entails to stop drinking, especially as a mom. And I'm particularly curious on hearing what it's like to cope with the sleeplessness, the tantrum, the social pressure, and everything else that comes with motherhood when you've made such a big commitment to yourself, right? In the in the realm of, of not drinking. So I'm going to start. What is it like to deal with, you know, the fourth trimester, postpartum, and a baby, toddler, when you're not drinking, how do you cope with it? Let me answer that question by just sharing a little bit of background. I haven't been drinking alcohol for three and a half years now, and my son is 19 months. So I was already alcohol free before I became a mom. So I kind of had the tools and like, I got used to not having alcohol in terms of coping with hard things. Um, but yeah, that fourth trimester, woo, like there were several, many times I was just like, man, if I could just have a drink, <laughs> things would be much better. But in my experience with the way alcohol affects me, it would actually get much worse, um, not better. So, um, I mean, those sleepless nights are hard. The crying and only wanting mama really hard. I think that those were the moments, the mama, 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 I don't want dada at all clinging to me and like I couldn't even go to the restroom those were the times where I was thinking okay I would love a drink um <laughs> but you know yeah. I think that in terms of what I had to do to cope I regularly go to therapy so a lot of therapy um to talk about those feelings that come up and why I want to drink so um, it was that feeling of, you know, being uncomfortable and stressed and not having a support system. Although I do have a support system. I don't want to say, you know, I have family here. My husband's a wonderful partner, but he is not mama, mama, mama. So yeah, it's, it's, it's really a bit different. Yeah. yeah. And so I think what I learned most and what has helped me is just really communicating my needs. That is something that I did not do when I was in my disease of alcoholism or when I was drinking a ton, I would keep everything bottled in, all the stress piled up and I just what, drank because I didn't know how else to cope with it. Um, mm. But once I stopped drinking, I was able to start noticing what my triggers were. And my biggest trigger is just not sharing how I feel so now it's just like word vomit unfortunately in my house <laughs> and it's just like this is how I'm feeling I'm sorry I'm not being filtered right now but I need help here I need help here and it's just uh, being unapologetic about it being a mom is so hard and unless you're a mom you can't I mean there's I never understood any of it before I was a mom yeah and and now totally. it's just like oh it all makes sense <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I think yeah, yeah. I think you mentioned you mentioned something that like because I just got off with, of a call with my psychologist actually, um, and it took me a long time to go back into having a psychologist. And it's not you know I've always had psychologists on and off my entire adult life. It's not like I'm ashamed. Like I think it's a fantastic thing. You don't have to have anything wrong to need somebody to talk to. But I think as mothers, we sometimes subconsciously, but sometimes culturally or just by default, it's sort of like we become this like gladiators and we almost like don't give ourselves permission to admit because you feel so shitty admitting that you don't want your kid to be on you all day not good enough people that 
right or like you know it just feels like oh damn like I've all my life I've wanted this kind of love and now I don't want it or like oh my god there are people that can have kids and I have one and I'm complaining yeah. that she wants them all day but I think that I think that it's really important to admit to ourselves and have the conversation of how much you're allowed to feel the duality of it like I adore my daughter I am so happy that she is the way that she is and that she's with me but my god not being able to go pee without her rubbing my belly it's like somebody sent some fucking help <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, yeah it's that true mom guilt goes way hand in hand with all of this it's that right. culture that's somehow been created and it doesn't do us any services at all no right. yeah you always just feel like the less woman as well like if if you feel like you need mm. to ask for help as a mom you're just like oh I'm just not as good as a mom as someone else or whoever you're right. comparing yourself to and it's always like this comparison of what, what I'm failing I'm clear right. I need help I'm failing and it's just it's crazy um and then you have the added, just go to with it right <laughs> and then you have the added reminder because as you become a mom you're transitioning from being a woman, whoever you used to be before, to finding your new self. And so then it's this constant, yeah. like, uh, 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 am I doing it right? Is this is this the right path? Like, am I, am I messing up my child for life? Am I neglecting myself entirely? Am I yeah. not a good mom if I become a woman? Am I able to take care of myself and still be a good mom, right? And it's always like that constant battle that, that you know, we just, I, I feel like there's not enough room for us to have these conversations. And a lot of us are like, okay, well, I can't sit here and talk to my husband about this because we only have 30 minutes at the end of the night and I want to just engage with him and actually enjoy because we haven't had a talk in three months. I'm just going to have a glass of wine, forget about it, you know, and move on. And then the next morning you feel 10 times worse. (laughs) And because you've like pushed all of those feelings and stressors down and have no outlet except that bottle or that glass. In my case, it was a bottle. But if you're just doing (laughs) one glass a night, you know, it, it is, I mean, you just need... Um, a way to be able to just be, you know, the mom you are and not feel like you're doing it wrong, that you have to do it the way your parents did it. Because I culturally, in my culture, you have lots and lots of kids and you just do it and you're the homemaker and you stay at home and you do all the things. And it's just, we're compared to impossible levels of, you know, yeah. of of motherhood now. It's crazy. Um, and my boss is amazing. So my current boss is, um, also, she's a mom of three and she, when I, um, came back from maternity leave, I was sharing how stressful it was to work and then be at home and then go straight into momming. And she said, you know, at work, you give a hundred percent at home, you give a hundred percent, you know, in your relationship, you're trying to give a hundred percent, but that's like 300%. You don't have that. So how can you, how do we give a hundred percent in all aspects when we are just one person? So I always remember that when I'm trying to do too much. And in this equation, you don't exist. That's a really good uh, advice. Right. It's, but also in this equation, you don't exist. There's 300% that are going to kids, husbands and work and you are nowhere in the picture. You are nowhere in the picture. Right. And so I think that's also a big reminder to all of us because it's so easy to, I was, I was just having a conversation about this. It's like everything else takes priority. And you think about, well, hobbies, I don't have time to do hobbies because I have, you know, my job and my kid and the house. And well, what about self-care? Oh my God. And what time am I going to put a mask on? I have to do the dishes and the, the folding of the laundry and the baby's calling and, you know, and, and really what it comes down to, especially in the first, you know, that fourth trimester or that first year, really after giving birth, it's like, how much can I, you know, how much can I balance these balls without breaking any of the glass ones that are really important? Because every time you neglect yourself, what are you doing, right, to substitute that support you need, right? So, okay, you're not taking any rest, you're not taking any naps, you're not, you know, taking care of your face, you're not putting oils on your hair, you're not taking a massage, you're not taking an hour to talk to your friend and decompress. What is the consequence of that, right? Like in in our culture, like are we drinking more? Are we eating more crappy food? Are we, you know, more overwhelmed? Are we disconnected from our partners and then ju- not judging them, but like, um, uh, what is the word? Oh my God, I have a mom brain. Like um, resenting them. Resenting, yes. Are you resenting, right? Because every time that you decide, I'm not gonna sit here and pester my husband with how I feel about the workload today because he worked a full time day as well and he worked ten hours today. Who am I to complain about the amount of laundry? then are you resenting him that's tomorrow? also another thing I, it's crazy and also like I for me as well one of the first things was the I didn't realize how much you will feel differently from your husband you know when you have a kid 
Like I didn't realize how much different it would be how we would feel. And that was a big shock because I would resent him for not feeling the same way as me or for not, you know, mm. you know, like I'd be like, why are you not more upset about this? Like, why am I, you know, the one that is upset and you're just there like living life. <laughs> living your <laughs> you know, best like, life. Yeah, exactly. I'm always, that, that I'm always impressed. That... <clears throat> I'm so impressed with how men generally, at least the men in my life, maybe it's not all men, but the men that I have perceived, how they can be so chill in situations like, you know, it's like Alaska's not eating, you know, and I'm just like sitting there going like, okay, she's going to get malnourished. Oh my God, she's going to have a deficiency and she's going to die, you know, in a week because, oh my God, you know, even though she's like completely perfect weight above levels and everything, you know, and he's just sitting there going like, eh, she can just have a yogurt. And I'm like, what the fuck? What do you mean a yogurt? <laughs> yes, exactly. But, like but he's all. not, he's not, but he's not sitting down and wrangling a toddler for a meal three times a day. Right. And I think that's a difference as well. It's like when you look at the big picture and it's not to diminish what dads do, because I think that they have a different role as well. But I, I went through a period of feeling extreme guilt for not being fun. You know, like Roger would come home sometimes and I just be like, okay, well you guys go play. And then I see them playing and I'm like, fuck man, I'm the bitch running around like all angry all day, trying to get things done. And here he is the fun person, you know? <laughs> yeah. But then talking to my husband recently, I actually realized that he feels a tremendous amount of guilt as well, but just differently. Like he he feels yeah. like I'm not there so many hours. I don't have those deep connections. Like you're still the default parent. Um, you know, I'm not like for him, for example, like a thing was that he felt like he was not teaching her anything, right? Like I get to be homeschool mom slash, you know, crazy, whatever lady running around trying to get everything done mom, right? And so but whatever she's learning, I get to be like, oh, look, we went out and we looked at the yard and looked at the trees. And now she can spot a fruit tree from like a mile away. And that feels nice because we learned that together. Whereas for him, he's like, I'm just fun. I'm just fun. Anybody could be fun. You know, like might as well not be the dad, you know, like whatever. <laughs> and so like, it's, it's yeah. interesting because where we stand, it, you know, the grass is always greener. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so all of this all of the things that we're doing for our kid is just like giving them all of these opportunities and teaching them and like giving our breast milk and like our sleepless nights you know we're giving them all this stuff at the end of the day it's super common to want to reward yourself right and so yeah that's well. where you get into that whole like okay well I deserve this beverage I deserve this glass of wine or whatever cocktail it is which is it let's can, talk can about fine. that how do yeah. you make that how do you, for you what was that switch like how did you go from this is a reward because I've just experienced that recently I've, I've worked really hard on this this year so let me tell a little bit of my story when it comes to alcohol I love wine I don't love alcohol I don't, I've never been a person who's gonna sit there and drink a bottle of vodka on my own that's not my thing but I love wine I love why I feel like like, like I'm you know, related to Jesus, like wine is my blood sort of thing. Like, I just love wine. I love the history, the making of it, like the whole thing of it. Like, I swear to you, it's it's a thing, you know, like you will not see me ordering a cocktail anywhere, but put a nice bottle of wine in front of me. And it's like, ah! you know, like anyway. Um, So I had to like also do this switch because I started learning biohacking and how bad it is. And I started realizing like how bad all this intake of all this, you know, like process and the sulfates and all these things are for me. And so I started taking it out of my life in an attempt to detoxify myself. And then when I started seeing the results, it was like, oh shit, like this really does, it should play no, no, no role in my life. Like I want to feel amazing. I don't want this momentary reward that's later on going to cause all these problems. Right. And I felt amazing this whole year without drinking and I don't actually miss it at all when I go out and stuff like that. But how do you go from, for you, because for, like, for me, it's still like, I can just go and have a glass of wine. So I feel like it's not really a fair question, but how did you make that transition, especially with having alcoholism and not just like a choice of drinking, um, like making that conscious decision of like, this is going to go from a reward to something negative. And if you exchange it with something else, how do you make sure that something else doesn't become another negative habit? Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's a lot of questions in that one question. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just trying to figure out where to start. So I will share that when I um, decided to get sober, I was in a really bad mental state of mind where I was just an unhappy person. I have like the best husband and I hated him um, for no reason. And, you know, I was just like, okay, something isn't working. 
I've been on antidepressants for many years. So I was begging my psychologist to give me more antidepressants. And she was like, okay, well, before we do that, how much are you drinking? And I was finally mm-hmm. honest, you know, at the doctor, they always ask you, how much are you drinking? It's super easy to just be like, just one glass with dinner, right? <laughs> but for me, it was like two bottles a night I was drinking. And so um, it was a lot. And so um, I had to go cold turkey and it was really, really hard. Um, I oh. I saw how it was affecting me. I had been drinking since I was 16 years old and I'm 38 now. So it was a long, long time of just like constant poison in my body. Um, and I actually did the route of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, that is what helped me where I got to go to meetings and hear from people who were going through the same things or had similar experiences. Um, and that's when I realized how our brain has kind of wired, or I'm going to say for me, because for other people, it could be a totally fine, you know, uh, recreational activity. But for me, it can get really bad really fast. So um, I had to go, I had to switch my brain from like, okay, I need a glass of wine. I had to, I had to think about what was making me want that glass of wine. Like, oh, am I super happy because I had a good day at work and I want to reward myself? But what's under that? Is it still like that lack of connection? For me, it was a huge lack of connection in general. Like I was not connecting with my friends. I was not connecting with my husband. I was just like not connecting with people. So it was a reward with wine. That was like my connection. I don't know if that makes sense, but it was like a way of like filling up my cup instead of the way I could, what fills my cup now, which is, you know, getting together with friends and having quality time with my husband. Um, And so I'm trying to think, okay, so I went from that and I also saw that, wow, I was just reaching for wine for everything. Like, oh, I had a bad day. Let me get a glass of wine. Oh, I had a great day, glass of wine. Oh, I um, had both. I had a really good day and a bad day. And I really like something. There's always a reason. Two glasses. (laughs) (laughs) And, And for me, it just wasn't working because once I had one glass of wine, it turned into many, many glasses of wine. And so Mm, it was easier to cut it out instead of trying to moderate it. Because if I was moderating moderating my intake, I was too focused on that to even enjoy what was going on. Like I'd be Mm. like, oh my gosh, I can only have one. There's only like this much left. What am I going to do? You know, it's like, like, why am I thinking of that when I could just be like living life and Mm. being, you know, and experiencing whatever I'm experiencing. So for me, Total abstinence is way easier, although it's hard because I also love wine. I love wine so much. I think I'm I'm Italian inside. My husband's Italian, so (laughs) I'm always like, see, I married into the right family, right? But I don't even drink wine. You really did. Oh yeah. Um, I actually felt like uh, that reminded me of when the during COVID, like the first month, which was before I got I was pregnant. uh, We were drinking like that. I remember like thinking like oh we were just having one glass and then you just look at the glass and like oh they're so tiny you know like I need more so you just go for the extra one and then by the end of the night you've already drank a whole bottle of wine by yourself um and I, I related to that I was like oh I remember that <laughs> thinking of yeah. that um this was like this oh this little glass is nothing and I'm at home I'm doing nothing all day yeah and you might well, yeah. so long. they were so long yeah. back when we were all shut down right so it's like that little glass of wine was supposed to get you five more hours <laughs> Like, yeah, how? exactly. Like how? <laughs> how? The matter is like for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm just sitting here wondering how the hell you're 38 and you've been drinking all your life and you look the way that you look because like alcohol is supposed to age you. It's one of the reasons like <laughs> we buy a hockey and I'm like, okay, I, you know, like if I take away alcohol, maybe I'll just, you know, help my, my skin. And then like, how right. the fuck are you 38? Right. Like, damn, I know. I'm like, uh, I would like to thank my mom for the genes that she's left <laughs> me. I have no other excuse. <laughs> I like to thank my family, particularly yes. the females thank that you. pass down thank their great genes. Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Okay. I'm so sure Paula- I have a question okay, now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you. Still my question. Um, okay. So the last one is the social gatherings. How is it that like, or whenever you meet people that drink, do you feel like they pressure you, or do people like respect you, or do you actually feel pressured, you know, to drink, or how do you feel about the whole thing? Sure. So um, another, again in one. <laughs> okay. um, another background to that, again, I got sober in um, the pandemic. So 
Luckily, I did not have to deal with social yeah. gatherings. So I was able to kind of get my own grounding in my sobriety before having to like re-enter the social world. Um, so uh, when I first started going to social gatherings, once everything opened, I think I had maybe like, I don't know, six-ish months or so of sobriety. And it was really uncomfortable. I was like so anxious. I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to tell people? What do I, how do I navigate this? Oh gosh, my sobriety is going down the drain. I'm definitely drinking. But, you know, I was able to share just like, hey, guys, I have issues with alcohol. I'm not drinking today. I'm just going to have a drink. No one cares. No one cares as much as we yeah. think. And so it's like, yeah. we have all this worry and like, literally no one cares. Like, no one cared. <laughs> I don't even know how else to say that. No one cared I when think, I told them I, I wasn't drinking. I think it's drinking. also... I think when you're vulnerable, people are more willing to accept your answer. I think if you're just sitting there like, I'm not drinking today, they're like, oh, why not? Look, I just yeah, made this. Why not? I drink, but drink this. Yeah. And but stuff. if, but if, if you actually say, somebody, I have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. everybody's like, oh, damn. Okay, great. Yeah, good for you, you know? I also yeah. think there's a there's a big uh, movement towards NA drinks, especially in the States. Like, we're now having bars in, like, the big cities, like New York and stuff like that. Like, totally non-alcoholic bars where you go and get a cocktail, you go whatever, and it's, like, CBD infused or just... But I, I tasted a beer the other day that I swear to you, like... So, I love IPA beers, or I used to love IPA beers. And, you know, like, I'll literally go around the world, and like, I would not drink any... I don't care about beer at all, but IPAs are, like, a thing. And my brother came home the other day with an IPA beer that I swear to you, like, I would never, ever, ever in my life choose an alcoholic beer over this beer. This beer has no alcohol, but it tastes just like an IPA. It's so amazing. And so I think there's a big movement towards this that's helping people with problems, but also people who just don't want to, like, completely, like, if you're, you know, you have things to do at home, you're working at night, you have kids or whatever, you don't want to go home drunk, but you want to go have a drink. And I think there's a big movement. But my last question for you is, <clears throat> does your husband drink? Yes. How How is that for you? Um, it does not bother me. He likes a little glass of whiskey and whiskey's never been my drink. Um, it mm. took him a while to go back into wine because I was very triggered by wine. I was just like, oh my God, it smells so good. Let me have a drink. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I yeah. really wanted wine. So, um, no, he was wonderful. When I first started getting sober, he helped me by hiding all the glasses or the bottles of wine in our house. And he was just like, I won't, I won't drink the wine. I was like, okay. Once I started getting a little more comfortable and like going to family outings, cause his family is big on drinking wine. Um, I, you know what? It kind of also answers Paula's question is like, I just being around people drinking, I just need something in my hand. It was like a habit. So like, it doesn't have to be wine is what I've learned. Yeah. Like I can have a sparkling water. Like I have like so many, oh my God, they're all falling. I have sparkling <laughs> water cans everywhere. <laughs> like I, I love sparkling have, water. Yeah. I just need to have, be holding something. And that makes me feel like I'm like part of and not super different. And so that's like one way that I've kind of gotten around it. And like now it honestly like doesn't even matter when people are drinking heavily or like wine around me. We actually even went to Italy early this year. I was really worried about that because I was just like, oh my God, the wine is everywhere. <laughs> like there's just gonna flow from the, the street. Mountains, like, what am I gonna yeah. do? <laughs> it was fine. Like I can be around it now because I have truly accepted that wine is not my friend or any anything alcohol is not my friend what it's going to do is I'm going to have some and it's going to shift my way of thinking and I just become a very unhappy person and I love kind of just having that happier positive outlook that I didn't have before so I think I just have chosen to just alcohol is just not part of my life anymore that's awesome. And it's that. so empowering too, because I think, yeah. I think for a lot of us, whether it's alcohol or something else, like we always, you know, I feel like the human condition is like finding a, you know, like a crutch, like there's always something that we're like leaning on because it's almost like we don't give ourselves enough power as we are. We always need something else to help us through. And I think what happens when you make, you know, a decision like this, I also quit things cold turkey when I do, like, I'm just like, ah, I'm just done you know yeah and I think that it's really hard at the beginning but the power that comes with that is that you start slowly realizing the things that do bring you the joy and it's like oh well what I enjoy was not being drunk with my friends what I enjoy was my friends or you know exactly. and I think as you start doing that and you start like shifting 
um, I don't know, it's really empowering. It's like you start really liking who you are. And I feel like if you have a history of using substances of any kind to to sort of attach to your self-worth for so long, once you start discovering your self-worth without that, that's really freaking cool. And it's sort of like, it becomes like a new high. It's like, I don't want to let this go because like, why would I ruin it with a glass of wine that's going to spiral me down into becoming a monster when I really like what I've become and I've worked so hard to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And I think it just comes back down to like coping methods and like what works for you and what's healthy and what's not. Because what's just, just fascinating to me is that mommy wine culture is like looked at as like not healthy but kind of like I don't know but if we were to yeah. put put something that was like it's normal it's normalized as normal. a normal yeah. thing it's a but fact it's, it's a yeah. Thing, yeah and it's it's crazy okay. because like for some people it just doesn't serve them and it's not healthy it's almost like why are we allowed to advertise mommy wine culture but not like mommy cocaine culture I don't yeah. know like you know <laughs> like true it's true it's very true I yeah. always find yeah, that I like, always find that really amazes me how alcohol is so advertised and so you know out there when you know so many people suffer from it some many people are addicted yeah. to it and it's just and it's and poison it's like, literally known yeah. to be poisoned mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah. like you're a shit mom like if you're giving your kids it. Yeah, you're a shit mom if you're giving your your kids sweets or, you know, Red 40. But if you're chugging a glass, of, a bottle of wine while they're watching Coco Melon on it, like, endlessly, then, then it's fine because you're just helping yourself. You know, it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, judgment, think, yeah. you know? One thing I'll say so we can, like, close off this is how, what, what, what would be a message you would say to a mom or a, a woman that was starting to stop drinking? So if they're going to stop drinking now, what would you be your word of advice? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, finding your community is like the most important thing, because if you feel alone, it's way easier to dive back into habits you don't want to dive back into. But if you have like a commitment to yourself, and you do want to kind of dabble in a sober life, then trying to find the people who uplift you and support you on that journey, because otherwise, you know, Without that, it'd be really hard to make such a drastic change, especially when it's around us everywhere on social media, on the commercials and all of that. Um, But just trying to, you know, get those connections to people who feel like they're your tribe. They support you. That's awesome. That's very good advice. (laughs) Yes, this mom friends or friends of any kind, but especially the mom community, once you have find your mom tribe, that's really honestly it's so underrated there's nothing better than that it's life changing it it is for sure thank you thank you so much for your vulnerability and for sharing your story this is awesome and for coming on with us if you're listening to this and you have a story you want to share a topic you want to talk about please let us know um you can let us know either in the comments if you're watching this on youtube or you can come and visit us on instagram at who let the moms out that pod we are always open for any kind of mom conversations absolutely judgment free and we will see you next week thank you stephanie thank you thanks for having me Bye. bye